part of it is I, I think you have to look at at what something really is, not what you want it to be. And so like when you look at the sports journey, you know, we look at the two or three phenoms that make it and then we create our model based on them. Well, that's not the majority. And, and so like when I, when I look at the research and go, hey, even in our home where kids may be somewhat athletic, like statistics will say athletics will not be part of their life past 17 years old for the majority, not past 13. And so like a lot of parents will ask me like, well, hey, when do you think a kid should start playing sports? Well, I don't know, I'm not God, I don't, I don't have an answer. And I think, I don't think there is a definitive answer. I think there's boundaries you can create, but I think the question needs to be not when my kids should start, but who do I want my son or daughter to be when they finish? Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. This is your host, Jim Harso Jr., and today I bring you Heath Eslinger. I've had tons of amazing guests on this show, well over 100 now, billionaires, astronauts, professional athletes, world-renowned entrepreneurs, and they've shared their insider secrets for success. They've offered everything from top book recommendations to success hacks to action items that you can use today to see results immediately. If you're like me, you love this kind of stuff. And if you're like me, you want to get the cliff notes, or I guess these days they call them the spark notes. Well, you can get access to the action plans from your favorite guests, like Spartan Race founder Joe DeSena from episode 27, or Navy SEAL Mark Devine from episode 45, or maybe fitness guru Tony Horton from episode 85, plus other amazing tips and tactics to help you Get clear on how to get from where you're at to where you want to be. I put all this in one place because you're busy and you want to get what you need quickly so you can move on with your day. Here's what I want you to do. Go to jimharshawjr.com slash action to get instant access to everything I just talked about. That's jimharshawjr.com slash action action. And if you're listening to this on iTunes, there are three dots on your screen. Just touch the three dots, select view full description. There you'll see the link to download all the incredible resources and action plans that I just mentioned. Now for today's guest. Heath is the CEO of A Better Way Athletics. He's the former head wrestling coach at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. Heath and I got to know each other years ago on the wrestling mat as competitors, one-on-one, -on -one, head to head. And uh, it was approximately 1995 or 96. And uh, he was a fierce competitor and, uh, and we had a, a great battle. And he loves to bring up anytime we cross paths, we, he loves to uh, bring up that match. But anyway, and he brings it up right at the beginning of this interview as well. But Heath has a great perspective on not only athletics, not only leadership, but how to live your life. He's one of the most inspirational people I've ever met. I heard him speak at the FCA breakfast at the NCAA wrestling championships a few years ago, and I was absolutely blown away with his ability to engage an audience, but more so that this all came from his heart. And he really shares his heart in this episode around that voice that we all have that inside of us that's saying you don't belong. He shares about how fear and anxiety as they increase, that are how our performance decreases. And he also shares how we are our greatest coach. So you're going to get a lot out of this episode, whether you're an athlete, a parent, a sports parent, a CEO, a leader, a teacher, it doesn't matter your role. You're going to take a tremendous amount away from this episode and this interview with the one and only Heath Eslinger. Heath, welcome to the show. Man, so fired up to be here. I mean, last time that uh, I saw you, you know, up close and personal was 20 years ago when you were kicking my tail as a redshirt freshman. So for all of you out there that listen to Jim, like success through failure, he was part of my failure. All right? So I appreciate that, buddy. He, he always loves to bring that up. I actually, you, you and I bumped into each other at a wrestling match in Charlottesville, UVA. And uh, you know, that was like the first thing you told my kids, you know, yeah. it's like, it's such a personal thing, you know, and yeah. uh, no, anyway, hey man, you made me better. I got to say thanks. You were one of those guys that you just didn't want to wrestle again, though. Yeah. So it was a battle. It was a scrap. And uh, it's like, it's, it's funny with the sport like wrestling. And I think anything where you're in competition, but maybe more personally, even wrestling is like you become friends and, and just have this mutual respect for people. Uh, so uh, 
Uh, very I'm glad grateful we, for that. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad we formed this friendship and got to connect. But hey, man, something I didn't realize about you when doing some research, and I did do a little bit of more background research on you. You're a Ironman finisher, 10:51. Yeah, That's a pretty good time. Yeah, 10:51. It was, uh, you know, about four years ago. I was, I was just about to turn 40. I told my wife I needed to just test my toughness. She said, "How are you going to train?" I said, "I don't know. I'll figure it out." You know, and I mean, I very, sim I simplified the training. I simplified the diet. I went very blue collar, but ended up having a great race, and it was a ton of fun. We had about eight wrestlers that year that did it. You know, so it was kind of a little competition between us. Yeah. So it was fun, man. So for a guy who you were coaching at the time, right? Mm -hmm. You're still the head coach, which is four kids four kids like me, life consuming job and yep. four kids. Like how in the heck do you find time? Cause that was, it's kind of my excuse. Like you're going to blow it out of the water. I just ran a marathon for the first time. And my excuse, cause I've always thought in the back of my mind, I want to do an Ironman, but I'm like, man, I just, I don't know if I have the time after the, all the training time that it took just for running the marathon, like Saturday mornings, the long runs going out for, you know, a couple, two, three hours at the end. It's a lot of training. And my excuse, which was pretty sweet up until this conversation was I didn't have the time to do it, but uh, I guess you're going to blow it out of the water. Go ahead. So again, I simplified and then I made sure I didn't overanalyze. I think one of the things, I actually think it's a detriment to the normal person. I mean, listen, if you're, if you're a professional triathlete, like it needs to be very detailed. If you're an ordinary human trying to break 12 hours or something like, you know, my thing was simplifies, simplify, don't overanalyze. If you have more time on a day, then ride your bike longer. If you don't, don't stress out about it. And so I would even do like, Hey man, I ride my bike 45 minutes in the morning. When I get up, I ride it 45 minutes at lunch. And then I ride it 45 five minutes right when I get home. Well, you know, that's over two hours of training, but I just didn't have time to do it at once. And so one of the things I think that's unique about Ironman, because it's such a long day is those long chunks of time, they're important to sprinkle them in. But at the end of the day, man, you got to be on your feet, you got to be in the saddle, and you got to spend enough time in the pool to be or the lake to be comfortable. And so I did way less swimming, I did way more biking. Ironman is, you know, you make your time or not, I believe on the bike, because it's the largest chunk of time. And so if, if ever in a day I had extra time, I would get on the bike. The other thing I did was I had fun, man. Like I trained with people, we fellowship, we encouraged one another, you know, we had some wrecks, you know, but yeah. it, it was a blast. I mean, to me, it was an experience, not just a competition. Now, once you, once you get there, it becomes a competition. Sure. It's game day. Yeah. It's game day. So and it's nerve wracking, man. You're jumping in that water and you're like, dude, I got a long time to exercise. Yeah. So how do you, you found the time to train for it. You, you made it work for you. You made it your own. Yes. And I just want to reflect for the listeners, like there are certain things that sound like were in place for you that allowed you to find success. There were like-minded people. I call it the environment of excellence. It's something oh that you and I had oh, when yeah. we were on a team as athletes. Yes. So you have like-minded people around you. You have a clear vision, a clear goal. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're okay being you like you're okay with your plan you don't have to follow this plan or that plan or the other plan certainly you did your research and yeah. and you you did your background work but but you followed your own plan right yeah and so what i did is i found this it was 16 weeks to a 13 hour iron man and it was for someone who had like some base conditioning i'd done a half iron man a lot of triathlons done a couple of marathons and so like I was a fitness guy and I had tortured myself in the sport of wrestling. And so like I got this like 16 weeks to a 13 hour Ironman. And then like I made sure I kind of did the base. And then if I had a day where I had more time, I would do a little more, but I, I never stressed out about it. And I think that's one of the things, you know, when fear and anxiety increase, performance decreases. And I think sometimes even for like the average Joe, just going out to like do an Ironman to test themselves, we, we almost like we psych ourselves out in essence. It's like a wrestling match. You know, we get so anxious about it. I even had a friend the following year that called me and he said, Hey man, did you use a heart rate monitor and a watt meter and all this? And I said, yeah, I used a heart rate monitor and I put my two fingers up to my <laughs> neck and took a picture. And I was like, dude, I know when I don't need a watch to tell me when my heart rate's up. Yeah. Like when I felt good, I rode my bike harder and I ran harder. If I was exhausted, I rode my bike slower and I ran slower. Again, the greatest coach in any, any individual's life is themselves. And so if you're willing to look at yourself in the mirror and be honest, 
well, then you can make progress. Like that's what makes you coachable, even from an outside factor. Like if coach Harshaw says to me, Hey, here's an area you need to improve. That's great information. But I, I next have to look in the mirror and say, Heath Esslinger, this is the truth about you and you must address it. And I've got to accept that feed, get feedback, process it and do something with it. Cause you can tell it to me, but if I don't recognize it and own it, it doesn't do any good. It's just great information. And so I think that's part of, you know, when you choose to do something like that, just be willing to be really honest with yourself. Do you think people struggle with that, being honest with themselves? Oh. I mean, whether it's training for an Ironman or trying to get the promotion or live their lives the way they want to live their lives in accordance with their values, et cetera. Do you think, you know, and I do think that people aren't always necessarily truthful with themselves. I mean, do you see that in people? Oh, I think it's so hard, man. It's, it's hard for me, man. I don't want to be honest sure. about it. And I think yeah. what makes it even more hard is we live in a, in a world of comparison. We have access to everyone's stuff. And, you know, the thing is, is all the things we post have the ability to be edited. You know, I talk about family photos, like when, when the Esslingers go to take family pictures, you know, especially when our kids were little, listen, man, we take 3000 pictures and three turn out perfect <laughs> and we post them. And so then what people a beautiful look at, family, everything's yeah, perfect. They look at the Esslingers and go, man, Keith is such a leader and you sure. know, Brandy's an awesome wife and their kids are perfect. And I'm going, that was a freaking disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we do is we, we take our worst day and compare it to the Harshaw's best day. And it's just dangerous. It creates a lot of like discontentment and unwillingness to be honest about where we are. I love this about Siri. I use this illustration a lot. And so like when you go somewhere on a trip, what's cool is you can punch in the address and like it gives you all these options to get there. And it will take you to the exact address that you punched in. And people are fascinated. But what's more fascinating to me about Siri is that Siri always knows exactly where I'm at. And so the key to, you know, efficient travel is not just knowing where I'm going, but it's also being willing to be honest about where I start. And so, you know, I always say, even in the coaching profession, one of the hardest things in coaching, we talk about, man, here's where we're going. Here's where we're going. The hardest part was going, dude, here's where we're at, man. I struggle in these areas. I need some help in these areas. And until we address them, it's almost like we're just carrying extra baggage on our journey. Same is true with an athlete. You have a freshman that comes in and they, you know, they, I want to do this. I want to do this. But listen, man, where are you at? Like, what's your, what's your area of struggle we need to help you overcome? And that's going to change your plan too. If you, you it's know. It's going to change. Yeah. And everybody's plan, everybody's starting from a different place, bringing yeah. their own experiences, bringing their own background, their own mindset, their own everything, their own network mm -hmm. to the table. And so your, your experience, your plan, your path to get from where you're at to where you want to be is not going to be the same as the next person's. It's not, it's not. Now we may, we may use similar tools, but if I'm not, uh, listen, if Siri starts, if I'm coming to Charlottesville and Siri starts me in Atlanta, instead of Chattanooga, Tennessee, it's going to be an, it's not going to be a, an effective route. You know, there's going to be wasted things there. And so that willingness to be honest uh, and to have people around you that are not honest about who you are to hurt you, but they're honest about who they are, who you are to help you. And that is a very, man, I, I call it your inner circle, man, your inner circle is so important. And if you want to know what your inner circle is, then look on your call log and see who the ones are you're talking to the most. And you better make sure that those people you're talking to the most have a real desire to help you get to where you need to be by also being honest about where you're at right now. And so, man, I say that to coaches all the time, man, protect your inner circle to, to children, like to young people, like, you know, protect your inner circle. It's the whole thing, you know, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. You know, you're the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. So if it's true of a 14 year old, it's also true of a 43 year old. Yeah. I want to go back to something that you said earlier, Heath, you said as fear and anxiety increase, performance decreases. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, like if I'm a nervous wreck, like it almost like puts me into a state of panic. You know, so people will ask me, like with my kids in sports, they're like, you don't say anything. I'm like, dude, even encouragement creates anxiety. Like if, I, if my kid's batting, I'm like, come on, Carson, you got this, you got this, you got this. I'm like, dude, that's overwhelming. True story. I was, I was at our house, this is probably like five years ago. You know how when your kids get their shoestring in a knot and they just pull it tighter and it's like a disaster and you're, you're like biting on a dirty shoestring. Right. I know that sounds horrible, but I'm a gross person, whatever. You know, it's my children's shoes that they've drugged. We've all done that with parents. Yeah, we've all, all done it. have done that. So, so like, I'm like literally biting on this shoestring and one of my kids come, comes up who I love and they are asking me a question. 
over and over and over. And I'm like, stop, let me, I get frustrated, like, and it kind of explode. And I'm like, I can't get this knot out if you keep asking me this freaking question. You know what I mean? And I froze. And I was like, that's exactly what it is for a kid in the sports world. We're, we're trying to help them and encourage them, but we're just increasing their anxiety. Like, just sit there. I love what Mike Matheny says. Mike Matheny says, your role as a parent is to be a silent voice of encouragement. Mm. And I've kind of adopted that model in my kids' lives. Like, hey, man, let's just be silent, love them, and for who they are, not what they do, and go from there. Heath, I've heard you say that society has become so consumed with an immediate outcome that we've lost sight of the lessons that our journey teaches. I mean, is yeah. that part of the fear and anxiety and, and the outcomes that we want? I mean, in some sense, is it the driving for those outcomes that results in this increased anxiety, this increased fear of failure? And how do we manage that? Well, I think, so it starts with perspective. You know, everything begins with perspective. You know, what we're dealing with right now in America, I mean, kids have to wear masks. Oh, it's awful. But when you've been to another country and you see what they're doing, like, we still got it pretty good. And so it starts with perspective. One of the things we teach parents is don't get so consumed with what matters now that you completely lose sight of what matters most. And so when I have perspective, it allows me to see, hey, this moment seems huge, but it's small in the big scheme of things. And so I think when we see it that way, it reduces the pressure and it, it, it's almost like pulling the pressure release valve on your life and going, okay, I can relax and enjoy watching this game because if they strike out or they don't, or they win or they don't, hey man, like we're, on, we're in this journey together and it's not a marathon, it's an ultra marathon, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. long. And so I do think it, it starts with, with having perspective. How do we gain that perspective? How do we, I mean, it's something that we talk about and it's, it's easy to talk about, but how do you, like, how do you implement that? Like, how do you gain perspective? How do you live that out? Because for the athlete listening, they have the goal that they want. For the parent listening, they want certain things for their child. For, for anybody who's in their career right now, in their working career, they want the next promotion or the next raise or the next job. I mean, how do we, how do we get perspective? Because we're, we're busy and we're going and we got bills to pay and things to achieve. You know, part of it is I, I think you have to look at, at what something really is, not what you want it to be. And so like when you look at the sports journey, you know, we look at the two or three phenoms that make it and then we create our model based on them. Well, that's not the majority. And so like when I, when I look at the research and go, hey, even in our home where kids may be somewhat athletic, like statistics will say athletics will not be part of their life past 17 years old. For the majority, not past 13. And so, like, a lot of parents will ask me, like, well, hey, when do you think a kid should start playing sports? Well, I don't know. I'm not God. I don't, I don't have an answer. And I, think, I don't think there is a definitive answer. I think there's boundaries you can create. But I think the question needs to be not when my kid should start, but who do I want my son or daughter to be when they finish? And so, when I reframe that question, like, hey, who do I want them to be? Not what do I want them to accomplish, but who do I want them to be? Well, then I'm a little stressed out. I'm a little less stressed out about, oh God, we're going to start, we got to start earlier. They're going to be behind or we got to get them lessons because they're not as good as little Jimmy, you know, at nine-year-old baseball. No, like I'm focused on who they are. Like you can catch up on skill development, but there's one thing that I've seen as I've coached at a lot of different arenas and age groups is, man, when you miss that opportunity of character formation, moral formation, emotional development, spiritual development in a child, it is hard to make it up later. Those habits are formed. And so to me, you know, six to 12 years old, we're going to really try to lay a foundation that whatever they choose, they can be successful. If it's sports, great. If it's academics, great. If it's being a great friend, awesome. But I call those long haul attributes. And so for, for me, one of the things that helps me is in every situation, how do I cultivate long haul attributes in my children? And long haul attributes are awesome because they're both global, they cross all boundaries. So whatever they're doing, they're beneficial. And then they're stable. They stand the test of time. So whatever age they are, they're beneficial. And so, hey, sports are great, but they're really there to help me create these long haul attributes because I don't know what the future holds. Yeah, Stephen Covey's one of the seven habits of highly effective people start with the end in mind. And that's what you're talking yes. about. Take the start with the end in mind and build backwards. And yes. sure, you might want your kid to be a major league baseball player, but you probably, I imagine, want them to be a happy, well-balanced, 
person with a good foundation under them and they're kind and generous and confident and all these things. Yes. So, so important. And it is hard, man. And even as a parent who's trying, it's so difficult that you at least have to put forth the effort and you have to have a game plan. Like you, you as a family have to sit down and say, hey, here are our boundaries. And these boundaries aren't here to limit us and they're not here to limit our children athletically or academically, but they're actually here to liberate us. And so we've had people tell us we're crazy. Like there's no way your kids will make it in the sports world. Well, guess what? They're all kicking tail. Yeah. And, and we didn't wreck our bank account in youth sports. Yeah. Heath, you were a successful Division I head wrestling coach. I mean, you were really making a name for yourself at UTC. Uh, you brought that program to national prominence. You started or you, you took on one of the, the nation's premier wrestling tournaments, you know, and, and grew that to this, you know, really well-known tournament. And you did a lot of great promotion for it and did a lot for the sport. And then you left, right? Why, why leave? Why leave when you were on this trajectory in your career that was absolutely incredible watching it from afar? Why did you leave to start a better way? Well, one, I didn't do it. I had some great people around me, some phenomenal, even with the Southern Scuffle, man, our administration, Jay Blackman, who's one of my closest friends to this day, you know, was very instrumental in that. So it's, it's all, again, it goes back to your inner circle. Like, who are you surrounding yourself with? And when I look at my best years, I look at that inner circle and go, wow, everyone was rowing in the same direction. When I look at years that we struggled, it was normally a lack of alignment. And ultimately that falls on me that the head coach, but you know, why did I walk away? I can remember sitting on my desk in my office at 615 Macaulay Avenue. I was on vacation and I called Jay and I said, Hey, I want to meet. He said, I get it. Like he knew it was coming and it was bad timing. It was bad timing in the sports world. It was the right timing for the Esslingers, for our family, even for UTC wrestling. I was exhausted and I was hungry to go do something bigger, not more important, just bigger scope. And so I can remember we sat there in my office that day and it was emotional, man. These are my best friends for the last 10 years. It's where my kids have grown up. And like, I love these people. Tom Brelli said, I'm the smartest guy alive because I got out with my friends and my sanity. <laughs> uh, and I said, most friends and most of my sanity, but not all of it. Uh, and so he said, why are you so passionate about this? I said, Jay, I became a high school head coach and my athletic director told me, good luck. You know, you got this. I said, I was hired as the head coach at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga at 30 years old, 31 years old. I don't even remember now. But I said, you were on the hiring committee. Like, you chose me. I'm honored. I said, but pretty much you told me, good luck, figure it out. I said, what's happening in the sports world today is we're handing people who are fully capable, but they're ill-equipped or later in their tenure, they're exhausted. And we're handing them the keys to a Ferrari and we're buying them no liability insurance. And I said, to me, it's negligent. And so I want to help coaches. You know, I want to help coaches not make some of the mistakes that I made. I want to help coaches not neglect their family, you know, like they are. And it's not always necessary. I mean, there's a sacrifice, but there's also balance there. You know, I want to help parents and navigate the sport journey so there's not so much carnage with our children. And so I became divided and, and you can't be great at, at all things. And so I, I had to choose and it, it was the right choice for us. It was the right choice for my family. I wanted to see my children grow up. I am so thankful. Man, I look at the path God took my life on and I, I mean, to, you know, cultivate a relationship with you and a Steve Garland and all that Mike Hurd at Arm Software. I mean, Mike Hurt loves me because our camps were huge when they first started. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, those relationships, people always say it's not about what you know. It's about who you know. I always take that a step further. It's not just about who you know. It's about who you know and what they know about you. Listen, I can know a lot of people, but if they think I'm a jerk, you know what I mean? Like, it's not good. So I'm grateful for all of those relationships, and I'm excited about the future. And how do you work with your clients? I mean, because I know you work with coaches. I know you work with parents, with athletes, uh, maybe even organizations outside of sports. I mean, what do you guys do? Yeah, so, so, so really we have three lanes that we run in. One is, you know, the education lane, public, private schools, secondary education. We go into athletic departments and offer parent education, coaching development, athletic director training. We offer all that online right now. I mean, we have an entire virtual training platform that we can hand to a school and provide training and education, ongoing training for both their parents and their coaches. You know, we also have it for youth sport organizations where we have a 
a system in place to offer parent education and coaching development for your youth sport organization. The number, when I travel around the country and even around the world speaking to coaches and I ask, Hey, what's the biggest issue you face in the sports world today? The answer is always parents. And it's comical and tragic at the same time because parents are really our greatest asset. The parents are not crazy. We call it a misapplication of love. The love has caused them to zoom in so far that they've forgotten what matters most. And so what we do is we walk them through some courses that allow them to zoom out and take a deep breath and see what their role really is on this journey and how they can make it better for their child. Our mission is simple, to restore the joy of sport for parents, coaches, and athletes. Well, we do that through helping them, not just through talking to them. And the other thing is governing bodies. I mean, we're, we're, we're right now, we're in the works with some awesome governing bodies to become the parent education platform for those governing bodies. So, man, it's super exciting and, and we want to have an impact and we want that impact, the ripple effect of that impact to, to be generations upon generations. I love it. I love it. You know, I feel like, Heath, you're one of the few people who I know that has got it figured out. I mean, you, uh, and I know you would say no, you're still oh figuring it out. Yeah, I do. Hey, I remember do. Those of course. Facebook, remember those yeah. Facebook pictures? That's what I was referring I to. I figured it out. It just looks good. Facebook pictures, man. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, dude. No, but you're, you're. We call that Photoshop. <laughs> that's right, right. You know, you're living your life with a vision and a mission. What habits do you feel have set you apart? What habits, what are the things that you've done, habits or routines that over the years you feel have helped set you up for success? Well, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, man. I'm just very grateful that I've always been positioned around people that want to see me be successful. Again, it's my one prayer for my children that they would be surrounded by great people. And I think it's really easy to, to go with the flow. You know, I always say like, man, when you stop swimming upstream, the further you go downstream, the swifter the current and the more dangerous the rapid. And so like you, it's a constant swim upstream and it's work, but it's, it's almost liberating. And so one, I think it's people. I've been positioned around some unbelievable people. That starts with my parents, man. And, and I didn't deserve that. I just got lucky. I was born into an, an awesome home that where people cultivated the right things. And my brother and I were both first generation college kids. He's a pediatric dentist, owns 11 offices. I was a coach, you know, in the education world. My wife says she married the wrong Esslinger. She <laughs> married the muscles. She married the muscles. I've lost all them. My sister-in-law married the money and my brother keeps printing it. So I don't know. I think she's a <laughs> jackpot. But, you know, so I think, it, I think it first starts with people. And then I think the second thing is it's diligence. It's a willingness to wait. I think we live in such a fast-paced society that even I was just on the phone before I talked to you and, you know, even in our business and, and you've been here, it's like, man, I just want to get to that place where it's just rocking and rolling. And I don't get to determine when that happens. All I get to do is do the work that's required. And, you know, sometimes that takes a lot of patience. And I think you got to be willing to just every day be diligent and take another step forward and not doubt the process and just trust and continue to receive input and feedback and be coachable. But I think it's been diligence. I think I made it through college wrestling because I was willing to show up every day. I was willing to yield to the instruction of the people that were leading me and I was surrounding myself with the right people. I think that I was somewhat successful in coaching because I was willing to show up. I was yielded to instruction and surrounded myself with the right people and things just moved in the right direction. And so, you know, I I credit those things to any of the success that I've had. Same with Ironman, show up every day, do something every day. Yeah. And what about failure? You know, we look at a guy like you who, who is leading this incredible life and, and you have this clarity on your path. Tell me about a time when you failed, a time when you failed uh-huh. and you might've felt that, that self-doubt, that hopelessness that comes from, from failure and how you were able to work through that. You know, I can remember it was 1995. I just graduated from high school. I signed with the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga because it was my only option. You know what I mean? I didn't get recruited. I never wrestled in a national tournament. Our team had just won two state titles, first time in school history. They ended up winning like 18 of the next 20. I had an unbelievable high school coach. I was a two-time champ at that time, and I was beginning to make the right choices. Like, I knew that it was going to be work. So that year, the World Cup training camp was at UTC, and so I was like, hey, man, like, dude, I didn't wrestle in the off season. Like, I had to, I had to work, man. And so, like, my, my wrestling IQ was low. And so, I remember showing up at UTC in my black Toyota Tacoma and a place that I would end up working 
who knew? Yeah. And like, dude, there's all these studs there training. And so there's this group of three. I don't even remember who it was because I think I blacked out like halfway <laughs> through. And like, I can remember just going up like an idiot and being like, hey, man, you guys care if I jump in? Now, listen, I had never really wrestled in a freestyle event at that time. I had gone to like a few practices, but like, I mean, so they're wrestling freestyle, they're elite level. I'm a graduating high school senior from the state of Tennessee, right? <laughs> and dude, I jump in there. Jim, no joke. I still remember like the pain in my face after that was over. Like <laughs> I have never since that day taken a beating so bad. And I can remember finishing and I was walking up the ramp at McKenzie Arena uh, toward McClellan. And because that's where my truck was parked. I didn't know I was going to work here or whatever. And I can remember as I'm walking up that ramp, there was a voice in my head. And here's what it was saying. You don't belong. You're from Tennessee. This is another level. Like, just go to school. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you can be successful. But then there was this other voice. And this other voice was an echo of all the people in my life that cared about me. It was the echo of all the things my parents had taught me, my coaches had taught me. And that other voice was simply saying, you are willing to do the work. You're willing to do the work. And so, I mean, I, I, I get chill bumps thinking about this. So I'm walking up this ramp and at the top of the ramp, there's a little information booth. And I can remember by the time I got to the top of the ramp, here's what I had done. I had told the voice that told me I didn't belong to shut up. I'm not listening. And I'd said, yes, I'd put my yes on the table that I was willing to do the work. And I truly believe from the day I walked in to the day I left, I was the hardest worker that walked in that place every single day. It, but it was a decision. It, it was a mo There's all these intersections where success and struggle crossroad. And that's, that's where we run into failure because when success and struggle intersect and you tuck tail and run, well, you failed. But when you look it in the eye and say, let's go, then that's where you overcome and, and hope is created and resiliency is built and your, you know, your tank is full. And so that day, that was one of those defining moments where I had to say like, hey, this journey is not going to be easy, but my yes is on the table and it's on the table every single day. And I think so many times today we put our yes on the table, but our hands still on it and we, we pull it away when it gets hard. And like I put, I put it on the table and then raise my hands and said, I'm all in. Wow. You know, for the listener, I want you to understand that little voice. You've got that voice in you as well. that oh. says you don't belong. You're not good enough. We all have that voice. And Heath, I love the fact that you, you spoke to that voice. You first of all acknowledged it and you heard it because usually it's so, it's so subtle and so deep. Oh, it's subtle, man. You barely hear yeah. it. It's there though. And it's just controlling us. But you brought it to the surface and said, shut up. I'm not listening to you. I'm, I'm going to listen to this other voice. So good for you, man. And that's, that's a lesson for all of us, whether, whether we're competing in athletics or to be the best parent that we can be or, or anything else in our lives. So that's a, that's a great lesson. Thank you, Heath. For the listener who's saying, okay, I'm in. I love it. I love what you're saying. What can they do? Like what next? Like after they finish listening to this podcast and giving it a rating and review on iTunes and then sharing it on their social media to tell everybody about it. But after they do those things, what's something they can do? Something in the next 24 to 48 hours to really start implementing what you're talking about here. And I think sit down, we, we do this with, with a lot of teams and parents when they have parent meetings, sit down with a sheet of paper. We, we like to give out a little picture frame, uh, a little piece of paper that looks like a picture frame and write down, hey, what are the five things that I value most? What are the five qualities I want in my children when they leave my home? And you put that on that picture frame and then you post it somewhere because that, those values and those things that matter most to you will become the filter in which you make your decisions. And so why, why am I able to say no maybe to some things that another family, it just it sucks them in? Because I know this is what's most important. Like this seems important. Uh, it's like, again, like we talk about Franklin Covey. It's, it's urgent, but it's not important. Mm. And so sit down and write those things down because behind every family photo that looks perfect hanging on our wall because it's been Photoshopped and we use the skinny app and all our pimples are <laughs> gone and, you know, someone's doctored it up. Behind every one of those family photos is reality. In, in every family, I don't care how you, good you are, it's the Esslinger family too. There's pain, there's heartache, there's success, there's struggle, 
there's all these different things and our values will help us battle through those moments. And so behind that picture are these intrinsic things that drive us as an individual and as a family. And so what I always say is, man, if, if those things that are behind that what looks perfect are not present, at some point that photo of that family will fall apart. And so as a family, like surround yourself with people that want to help cultivate those things. I mean, again, if you looked at my call log, you would see three or four people very common because those people, they hold me accountable and they also push me to be the best that I can be. They also value my family at a very high level. Even in coaching, I look back at my coaching career and there's, there's a few guys I hung out with the most in the division one coaching world. You know why? Similar values. Why, why are Steve Garland and I so close? Because Steve Garland would never want to see me wreck my family. If he saw me about to have a collision, he would actually call me out. And so like, those are the people you have to look for uh, in your life. And it's not always popular, but I promise you, it's always the most productive. Heath, we've been trying to get this interview on the books for a while. I'm so glad that we finally got the chance to, to connect like this and, and for you to be able to share your message with my listeners, man just impactful, life-changing. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this conversation and your openness and, and willingness to come on the show. Can you tell the listeners how they can find you, follow you, learn more about you, et cetera? Yeah, man, if you're, if you're a parent or, or you're a youth sport organization or you're just a human, man, we're just, you know, people ask me what I do now. Like, you know, are you a motivational speaker? <laughs> Absolutely not. Like, I, I, I say that I'm a pharmacist of hope. You know, my brother <laughs> writes prescriptions for real. Uh, you know, he went to school and he can actually write scripts. I say, well, I get to as well. They're not actually medicine in a sense, but they are, they offer healing. So I say I'm a pharmacist of, of hope. I, one of the things you'll see me communicate often is I truly believe that hope is the most needed prescription in the world today because despair is the most dangerous disease. Mm. And so listen, every day, you know, and I would say you asked me earlier, what's one thing people can do? Choose to be a pharmacist of hope because as you pass it out, people will give it back and you will become a magnet versus a force field. So at A Better Way Athletics, we would love to help you do that. You know, I also work for FCA Wrestling. That's our number one mission is to provide hope to, to coaches and athletes uh, in the wrestling community. But, you know, if you're a parent out there and you say, man, I'd love to like hear more about that, uh, go to a betterwayathletics.com. You can click on our virtual training. You can buy that course just as an individual person. You can also, there's a coaches bundle on there too that includes the coaching and the parenting stuff. We're always adding uh, new content and curriculum. Or if you're a youth sport, if you run a baseball academy or a wrestling academy or a volleyball academy, we would love to partner with you and provide you know, continuing education for your parents and coaches. And it truly is. It's the click of a button. Uh, we have made it so easy. You know, we know in the sport of wrestling, repetition is the key to learning. It's not just a one-time talk. And so we believe the online platform is so important because it allows us to hook them, but then also continue to remind them of why these things are important. And it allows us to put new content in there. The number one request we're getting right now as school starts back, how to navigate when your child gets cut. Mm. And, wow. and so because you as a parent, man, you have some fertile ground to teach some long haul attributes when your kid gets cut. But if you are so mad and you're making so many excuses, you will miss the moment. And so how do we help the parents zoom out and teach the things that their child needs to learn uh, through this and also love their child through it? Listen, it's painful, man. No one likes watching their kids suffer, but some of that suffering is healthy. Yeah. And so go to A Better Way Athletics, follow us on social media at Heath Deslinger at ABW underscore athletics. We'd love to partner with anyone out there. Excellent, Heath. Thank you so much. And for the listener, as always, you can grab the action plan. We've got all the quotes and tactics and suggestions and all the links that Heath just shared. You can grab those. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. We'll have all of those in a PDF waiting there for you. Again, jimharshawjr.com slash action. Heath, thanks for making time, man. Great reconnecting with you. You're the best. Thanks so much. And for the listeners, as always, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success. <laughs>